Welcome to Pause and Listen, everyone. Tonight, I am so honored to have on my podcast, Brian Calvert and his amazing dog, Dixie the Praying Dog. Hi, you guys. Welcome. Thank you for joining me tonight. How are you? We're doing great. Thanks for having us. Oh, absolutely. What an honor. So, Brian, um, let's start with um, a little bit of history, if you don't mind. So, for my listeners and the viewers um, tonight, I want to explain that um, recently here, you and Dixie were part of the amazing Amazon Prime show called The Pack. Um, it's, um, it was similar to The Amazing Race, um, but this time it was a human owner with their dog um, as uh, partners traveling all over the world, doing amazing uh, challenges, um, adventures, until uh, every time uh, at a challenge, somebody was eliminated until there was a winner. Um, Dixie was such a, a huge hit with everybody. <laughs> you just fell in love with her from the very beginning because she does this amazing howling. So she was, whenever we were watching and we didn't know exactly where everyone was at or at the end of a challenge, we were rooting for, you know, who was coming in. And if we heard Dixie, it was like, yes, we're <laughs> close, they're coming. Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we tricked a lot of people on a couple of the episodes. I know in, uh, in Italy, they thought that they had beat us because they didn't hear Dixie. Well, we were so wore out at the finish line. We were just kind of laying around and they come around the corner thinking they had, they had beat us and they seen us standing there and they're like, we didn't hear Dixie. So we thought we beat you, but That's yeah, and it, that, that how is, uh, was something else during the show, but you know, at home, she's very quiet. Is she know? really? Because I wanted to ask you, so let's pause there for a minute. Do you mind if we go back to yeah. seven years ago? Um, you know, when, when I read about, your story and about Dixie. Honestly, I was so moved um, because I know, uh, let's start seven years ago, there was a terrible house fire. And yeah, it was, uh, it's eight years ago, 2012, I guess almost nine years ago, whatever. I can't, I'm lost now because of the new year, but yeah. So uh, 2012, I had a house fire. I wasn't home. You know, I drive a semi for a living. I was, I don't go far when I, when I drive. So, but I was still an hour away from the house and the neighbor called and said something was funny at my house. There was like a burnt spot on my wall. He could smell smoke or she could smell smoke. It was a neighbor's young daughter. So I told her, I said, get in that gate, go to the back door, get the dogs out. Well, unfortunately she couldn't get through the gate. My other neighbor came over. He finally got in through the gate, come in through the, the back of the house. There was so much smoke. He couldn't come in. He yelled and yelled. No dogs came. And he said he tried to come in and look for him and he couldn't. It was just too bad. So finally the fire department got here. And uh, unfortunately, they found uh, all three dogs upstairs uh, passed away from smoke inhalation. So I'm deeply sorry. Yeah, it was. That must have been just horrible. Oh, it's it's devastating to this day, you know, so. It's like know, losing your family, right? Oh, exactly. I mean, I just lost my three best friends. So, right. but. When I, when I got here, they were out back. The fire department had got them outside and I don't, you know, put them under sheets and all that. So I got here. Nobody wanted me to go back and see them. I said, they're my dogs. I got to go see them. So I went back there and said my piece. And uh, actually my vet paid for him to be cremated for me. He didn't charge me anything. And I got them all in these real nice boxes and just a sad, sad deal. But, you know, I tried, I mean, I just lost everything that I owned and my dogs. So it's a lot to take on, you know, I live by myself. So, you know, I've got family and friends that are close. So it was, it was a, a little easier, you know, to have that, that help with that. My buddy, I moved in with him. So just a, just a tough situation. So I had people wanting to give me money and this and that and the other, I had great insurance. I didn't need any money. So I thought right then let's, let's turn us into a positive from the moment this has happened. So I had people just send all the money they wanted to donate to my vet. I said, let's set up a, a separate fund. We called it Operation Happy Tails. So we put it in an account. So anybody that came in that couldn't afford to take care of their dog or their cat, instead of having to put that animal down, they could dip into that account and save that animal. And I know for a fact we saved two animals. So 
That's out, out of that. So that kind of started me thinking, you know, try to stay positive. Let's, let's do something good out of this down the road and, and see what happens. So finally, after I, I'm getting through the house fire stuff, I get my house back after about seven or eight months. Tragedy strikes again. I'm in my deer stand, cutting a limb down, getting ready to, to hunt that evening, and I slip and fall. I'm by myself in the middle of nowhere. My phone's in my Jeep because I wasn't planning on staying at that spot, you know, just for 10 minutes. That's all it took. 10 minutes changed my life forever. So I'm laying there on the ground trying to think about what am I going to do, you know, trying to figure out where I was even at. I didn't know where I was at because I was, I hit my head so hard, but I ended up crawling out of there and getting help. And I spent two weeks in the hospital with a collapsed lung, uh, broke every rib on my right side, my clavicle, uh, had a major concussion, ended up compressing some vertebrae in my back that they didn't find until two years ago, you know, like five years after the fact. So just all that, you know, come down and my dad had passed away in between that. So all those things just kind of happened. And I'm in the hospital bed thinking I've got to do something positive with my life. Something has got to change because I'm not the route I'm going. I'm not going to be alive by the time I'm 50. So I got a plan. I, I said, you know, you love dogs. You know, I, at that time, I, there's no way I could get another dog. So I'm just got this game plan together. I wanted to get a dog. I wanted it to be a therapy dog. I wanted to help kids. I wanted to help veterans and any organization I could help rescues, whatever, whoever I could help. But I wanted to get a puppy and start from scratch. So I know that it was how I wanted it to be. And then I just had to decide what kind of breed to get. Well, everybody's got, this is no offense to you Labrador lovers and golden retriever lovers out there. Those are super fabulous, great dogs. Um, but I wanted, I wanted a dog that when you look at that dog, you're going to smile right off the bat. So I've already got one leg up on you by just by the looking at the dog. So I said, I've got to get a hound. Then it was deciding what kind of hound to get. And just researching, you know, the, the bloodhounds, the red ticks, the blue ticks, you know, the walkers, the beagles, all those. I fell in love with the blue ticks just because of their coloring, their face. And I just fell in love with them. So I did some research and asked around and I found some folks and they all direct me to this one guy in South Carolina. They said his dogs are fabulous with kids, fabulous with people. They've got great demeanors and they're also great tracking dogs. And I was going to eventually use it to track, too. So I reached out to him and he said, I'm going to have a litter in a couple months whenever I was ready. So he sent me uh, pictures of all the puppies and told me to pick the, the one I wanted. I picked the female. My friend went down to get her. And unfortunately, there was a mix up. He had given the puppy away that I had picked out. So the only female that was left was Dixie. So this everything that's happened is kind of fate. Even the moment we got Dixie picked out, it's fate. I didn't. This isn't the, the girl that I picked, you know? <laughs> but thank God I have her. You know, it just worked out to where she was the one that was left. And I said, that's my dog. Bring her home. They that's brought her home. I had a party at the house, you know, my girlfriend at the time. And I had all the family over. I said, I got a big surprise for everybody. They thought I was going to ask her to marry me. But <laughs> no, I always surprised them with this puppy. So my buddies come in with this puppy and, and that's, that's how Dixie's story started. That's amazing. And, just for a second there, was your girlfriend disappointed that you didn't ask her to marry you? Instead, you were celebrating because you got a puppy? Because I love that. I think she was happy when she seen the dog, you know. Um, of course. How could you not? Yeah, I mean, it. she she really helped me. I've got to give her a lot of credit. We were together for, you know, Dixie's uh, just turned five. Uh, we were together for five years, a year before we had Dixie. So she helped me raise Dixie. And right before we left to film the show, we decided to go our separate ways. But I still owe her a debt of gratitude for helping me raise such a great dog. You know, I was very fortunate that she worked from home so she could take care of Dixie when she was a puppy throughout the day. So that training she got, she was potty trained in like four days. You know, we had her ring a little bell to go outside and just, I've heard bad things about blue ticks, how they're kind of hard and stubborn to get to, to potty train and all that. But man, we got so lucky and I, I just think we got it from the right person and, just a super, she's turned into a super great dog. She was just easy to train. Now she does have her moments. They're pretty food driven, you know, food motivated dogs. So, okay. but uh, we can, we work around it and she's just turned into a great dog. So I'm um, falling asleep in my arm. I know poor baby. Oh, I would, uh, I mean, I just want her to stay with us for a little while longer. Oh, um, she's fine. 
Oh, Dixie. Hi. You want everybody oh, to see God. your eyes? She'll wake up a little bit. I'll take her goggles off of her. There you go. Everybody Hi. see those pretty eyes. Oh, look at that beautiful girl. Hi, now, Dixie. This is why I picked this type of dog out. Look at that face. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I just love her. Oh, she's so beautiful. Such a great dog. She's so pretty. I mean, everywhere we go, you know, my, our, the United States, everybody's like, wow, that's that's such a beautiful dog. But when you leave the country and go to different countries, people have never seen a coon hound in their life. Yeah. So like, what kind of dog is that? So everywhere we went, everybody would come up. But unfortunately, while we were filming, nobody was allowed to come up and really pet the dogs or, okay. you know, there was a big security issue. And Right. They, they tried to keep people away from us as much as they could. But I told my security team that I'm like, hey, this is what we do. This dog is here to be petted on and loved on. So once the security team kind of warmed up, you know, and seeing what she does, they kind of relax that a little bit. And finally started letting, you know, kids touch her and pet her and and that kind of stuff around the world. So that's just that's what she is. That's amazing. And so at what point did you train her to be a therapy dog? Uh, from the moment I had her, I saw her train her to be a therapy dog. You know, I had a, uh, my friend owns a, a training, uh, he has his own training company here in Indiana. And I was fortunate enough to be able to bump some, you know, ask some questions to him. And he come over one day when she was a puppy and said, you need to do this and do that. And we just started working her, you know, and the big thing I wanted to do too is recall. Cause I know hounds are real bad at recall because of their nose. So we started that immediately too. I mean, eight weeks old, we're starting all this stuff, you know, that I can, that I can do with her. And then when she was three months, my buddy would come over once a week and we'd really start working with her with the therapy dog stuff. And basically your therapy dog stuff, you know, this, it's just, it's just hardcore obedience, yes. you know, and your dog has to have the right temperament. And fortunately we, we've got on her so early that she just developed into a great dog, you know, but you know, folks that see the TV show here are howling all the time. They're like, how in the world is this dog a therapy dog being that loud? But she doesn't, she doesn't do that. In therapy zone, you see her, she's just calm as can be at right. therapy dog events. Now I will have her bark. I can so, you know, she's known as Dixie the praying dog. That kind of, you know, once we got her to where she was almost one, the girls across the street from me, they uh, volunteer for an organization called Honor Flight. And Honor Flight, they fly World War II, Korea, and Vietnam veterans to DC and back in the same day. And pretty much every state on the Eastern part of the United States has one where they take these folks to DC just to honor them and, you know, give them respect and, and let them see a lot of these gentlemen haven't and women haven't had a chance to see those monuments. So they said, when you're ready, we'd like you to bring Dixie to our welcome home celebrations. When we bring these guys back from the airport so she can, you know, love on them and get pictures with them and do her thing. So that's what we started to do. And I'm like, man, I really wanted to get a pose where she could get down with these guys because most of them are in wheelchairs or in walkers. So I thought, you know, I seen a dog praying the other day. So I kind of worked with her on some different formations on how to pray. And it kind of morphed in that looks like the downward dog. I say, Dixie, pray. She goes right down to it and uh, stays there until I say amen. I say amen. She sits back up and I salute her and I say, all right, say thank you, veterans. And she'll bark it out. That's and that's how it started. And it's just taken off. That's so amazing. And I actually read about that today. You know, I wanted to read up some more about you and Dixie. And um, I saw the video of you guys uh, going to help the veterans, um, wish them good luck on their plane flight. Uh, Dixie would say hello to them. Then um, on even on the plane, you guys would go on and you would have Dixie say a prayer for them, have a safe flight, everything. And then you know, when they come back, you do the same thing. And the other part of that video that I so love is Dixie's favorite bakery. Yes. Yeah. One of my best friends, uh, his girlfriend owns a bakery here close to the house. And that's kind of our go-to place to go to get our treats. And it's called Paul Street Bakery. And she's, I'm telling you, it's a, it's a gold mine. You know, she is, she is so busy with that place. And she, she just makes special treats for every holiday and little, just anything she can think of, you know, she can make treats for it. And we go there and hang out quite a bit and uh, she'll have Santa Claus in there at Christmas time and the Easter bunny and that kind of stuff. Special bows for uh, Dixie. Yeah. Wear on her collar and band DNS for different yep. occasions. Yeah, she makes the, the little flowers for different occasions. Like if we're doing a, a veterans function, it'd be a red, white, red, white, and blue one. Or if we're going to a, uh, 
an outdoor expo like a hunting or fishing expo where we're going to do an appearance at or give a seminar. She has a camouflage one that goes on her collar. So we kind of, I kind of dress her to match whatever we're doing. So she, so she looks the part. She's got little outfits. I'm, I know I'm a, I'm a, I'm a guy's guy, but I still got to, got to get her dressed for the, for the right occasion. So. Oh, I think it's just absolutely phenomenal. I love it. Brian, why the love for the military? Um, I personally am a huge supporter of the military. Um, but I, you know, I'm wondering why is it such a passion with you? You know, I just think that, uh, I don't know, I've been around a lot of these guys in the past, especially through the outdoors and, and, and hunting. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend a lot of time in the outdoors with some wounded, wounded heroes, wounded veterans, and kind of got them out in the woods and to do things that they didn't think they could ever do again. I'm fortunate to have some friends that have some nice facilities where they can accommodate these folks and they've invited me to come out and help them. And I think that's kind of where it started, you know, probably 16, 17 years ago, helping those guys out. But I've always been very patriotic and wanting to do stuff. For, you know, I love my country and, you know, we've been through some tough times this year, the last year, I guess. So, but it's still our country. I've been all over the world. This is still the best country in the world. So, and it wasn't for those uh, men and women, we wouldn't have the luxury to do what we're doing. We wouldn't have, you know, so Absolutely. if I can do anything to help them out, that's what I try to do. And now that I have this dog, you know, I don't have millions of dollars like some of my friends do to help, help them out, but this is my way to give back. I've got this dog trained to honor them and show them respect and, that's, that's what we do, and that's the best way that I know how to do it. Yeah, you know, Brian, my, money can buy a lot of things, but with Dixie, she shows them love, and, and dogs make such a huge difference in, in anyone's, um, you know, in their mood, whether they're feeling sad, um, defeated, lonely. They see Dixie, and they can touch her, and she howls for them, and she says a prayer, and immediately their spirits are lifted. Oh, yeah, for sure. You know, I mean, a, a perfect example of that is one of our honor flights. You know, the Vietnam veterans are really tough to get to go with us. They're, they went through so much heck when they came home. They weren't welcomed home at all. They were spit on. And so these guys all have a chip on their shoulder. But I, we all know at honor flight, if we can get these guys to go on this flight, it's going to change their lives. You know, it's going to take that chip off their shoulder. And I hear it from every one of them. We had one gentleman, he came back. And when they come back from the airport, we take them to the local high school to the gym where all their family and friends are waiting. There's 3,000 people in this gym. These guys have no idea they're coming, coming home to that. This is their welcome home they never got. Well, one gentleman in particular didn't want to go in. He was terrified. He goes, I don't want to go in there. So he went to the restroom. So I took Dixie into the restroom with him and let her do her thing. And I said, hey, we'll walk out with you. So we walked him out. And afterwards, he was like, I couldn't have done that without her. So... That's just one of the things that one of the examples of stuff that she does for, for these, for anybody, really, not just veterans. I mean, anybody that's going through a hard time, you know, we're more than happy to go and, and do whatever we can do to help them. That's absolutely amazing. I love that. Um, you know, there's two organizations that are close to my heart um, as far as the military go. And I want to encourage people that if you are ever able to support and help them, um, one is a foster program. Uh, for the military. Brian, are you familiar with uh, the foster program? It's called PACT, actually, P-A-C-T. And um, it's where you have fosters for military um, personnel who are deployed and they don't have someone that can take care of their dog or dogs or cats. Um, so this organization provides fosters for their dogs or cats uh, while they are deployed and then when they come back, obviously their dogs and cats go back to them. But I honestly love I, I have heard of that. And that is super fabulous that, that somebody's out there doing that because I couldn't imagine, let alone you're, you know, doing your service for your country, but to have a pet and have to worry about, well, do I just, I can't give it away, you know, right. but they're in a position where they don't really have a choice. It's either they got to give that dog away or find somebody to take care of it. They've got to go and, and do what they got to do for their country. So an organization like that, I mean, that's that's amazing that it's out there. And I hope I hope more people utilize that instead of having to come to that decision where I'm going to have to give my dog up for my cat for an adoption because I got to go serve my country. That just doesn't sit well with me. So I'm glad there's somebody out there that does that. 
Absolutely. It should never be a choice for them. They should never right. to decide between, you know, serving their country, defending us, keeping us safe and giving up their pet. Um, we should, you know, it's just the right thing that there's in our organization and anybody that can support them, please do so. And Brian, um, I know that you and Dixie also do children's hospitals, um, you know, school visits. Um, how can someone get a hold of you if they wanted to um, have you and Dixie, you know, either via Zoom if it's too far away or in person come and do a visit? The best way to find Dixie and I is uh, on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. It's Dixie the Praying Dog. That's most of our contacts we get are through there. You know, we just, we've had two requests this week. Usually we're this time of year, we're doing all the outdoor expos, but they've all been canceled because of COVID. So, but we, we're still getting some things trickling in for later in the summer, but mo the two we've got so far are 10 hours away from us. So we're trying to work out the logistics and the pricing on that, because for something like that, I would have to, you know, I would have to charge to, to do that. So Absolutely. Um, it, we're in kind of a tough position because we do a lot of stuff for non for profits. So it's hard for me to say, hey, you got to pay, you know, I have to have this set fee to be able to come to do that. But it's it's just a position I'm in. It's kind of hard to do. And it just doesn't feel right for me to ask money from people to, to do stuff like that. But I'm at a place now where I almost have to do that because I get asked to go to so many different places. But most people are fine with it. You know, they just want her there to do her thing. And um I'd go to everything if I could. I just, it's just time and, you know, logistics of the whole thing. So. Absolutely. And especially with COVID, you know, I'm sure, yeah. you know, it's hard for anybody to travel. So. Yeah. Um, and now they've changed the, uh, the flight patterns for the flight situations for, for ESA dogs. You know, that's how we've, we've been flying. She is my emotional support animal. Um, from my accident, I did get a lot of anxiety and uh, just, nightmares about suffocating i can't breathe because of the lung issue and i've noticed since i've had her i've went off my anxiety medicine and all that and my doctor has said that she is definitely qualifies you for an esa dog so that's how that's how we flew to go to los angeles a lot to do the show stuff at the beginning but um now they've changed all that so if we have to go anywhere i don't know what we would do she would definitely would not fly cargo i'll tell you that so i'm gonna have to drive a lot of places it looks like now right um, so speaking of flying and the, I know, I mean, she's just asleep on your shoulder over there. Yeah. Oh, it's, she's so wonderful. Um, so I want to tell people a little bit more and talk a little bit more about the pack. Um, how, how did it, how did that all start for you and Dixie? Well, September of, uh, 2020, I, was on Facebook, kind of messing around with her stuff. I mean, her, her social media takes a lot of my time up, but it's all positive stuff. There's no, if anybody goes on any of her social media, you'll never see anything negative on there unless it's, you know, we're escorting a funeral or something like that, which it happens. That's what, that's part of what we do. That's kind of the stuff we've got to do. So, right. but it's all positive stuff. It's all uplifting. So if anybody goes on there, that's what you're going to see. So I was on there messing with her stuff and I just seen somebody had put a casting call on the note on the local Facebook page for the weather, for the, uh, for our new station here. And it says, is your dog adventurous? Do you, would you like to travel the world with your dog and do crazy things? I'm like, that sounds pretty cool. If so, email me. So it was a casting company out of Hollywood. So I emailed him. I said, Hey, my name's Brian. My dog's name is Dixie. She's a pretty cool dog. If you want to go check out her social media, you know, and see what you think. They emailed me back in 10 minutes and said, can we call you? I said, yes. Yeah. So I gave my number and they called me. So we talked the next couple of days. And then finally the following week we did a zoom call. And then the following two days after that, we did another zoom call. Then within three weeks, they flew me to Hollywood for three days. And I met with all the uh, casting company, the casting agency, which is renegade or the production company. And then I met with all the Amazon execs came back. Two weeks later, I went back out again for three days. Same deal. You know, they interviewed me. This was without Dixie. This was just with me, just to, just to meet me and, and get my story like I've told you guys here and kind of just the same thing. And uh, another week or so went by and they're like, hey, can we fly you back out here just for the day? We need you to meet with some doctors. So 
sure, whatever it takes. But you got to understand when I go out there, I've never traveled much. I've never been pretty much out of the, I've been to Florida, you know, I live in Indiana. So Florida is like a 11 hour drive for us, you know, you go down and go to the beach, whatever, but I've never really been out West or anything big like that. So I'm out here in California. I want to go see stuff. It's not how it works with TV. You're out there, you're out there to work. It's business. If you're not doing something for the show, you're in your hotel room and you can't leave. So I was not permitted to leave my hotel room during that time when I was out there. So the third time I went out to meet with the doctors, you know, you get a physical and get all that kind of stuff, make sure you're healthy enough to, to go and do this show. Then you meet with a psychiatrist and you take a, I think it was a 650 written question psychiatric test. They just want to see 650. Oh, it took me, it took me about two hours to do it. So wow. you go through and just, you just answer questions. What they're trying to do is get a pattern from you. Some of the questions are asked over and over again. They're just trying to see if you're lying or oh. telling the truth. And they want to see, they know, they know we're crazy because we're there anyways. They just want to see how crazy you are. <laughs> they don't want somebody that's too crazy on the show, but they want somebody just crazy enough to make it interesting. So that's kind of what they did. And then before you went home, you actually met with a psychiatrist. And he kind of talked to you about, he does it for all the, real, all the reality shows. Because with the reality show, there's a lot of mental stuff that comes with it, you know, beforehand, while you're filming, and then afterwards, you know. So he just wanted to prepare you for all that and see if you're in the right mindset to be able to handle all that. And then they flew me back home. And then right before Christmas, we went out for two weeks. It was They called it Doggy Boot Camp. What we didn't know, it was the final audition. There was 24 dogs there, and they were keeping 12. So when we got there, there was only 20 dogs. No, yeah, when we got there, there was 20, 22 dogs. And we all come in. They separate us in two different rooms. You go in and you sit down. They got everything out for you. They got your own kennel. They've got everything your dog needs. They've got set up for you. And you got that's your space, and that's where you sit. The, the girl that was sitting next to me, you know, they said, get your dog out and kind of get it acclimated that, that your surroundings. And she panicked. I don't know what happened to her. She grabbed all her stuff and left. I never seen her again. Oh, you're kidding. So, so within like the first two hours, we were down to like 19 dogs because people had left. And then slowly as the two weeks had went, we went and had to do uh, kayaking and paddle boarding, you know, and uh, rappelling and zip lining and all the stuff we practiced in warehouses, you know. And safety was the number one priority. I mean, if, if they would see what Dixie does when she's tracking and she gets cuts on her feet and all that, they would probably shut the whole thing down. That's how strict they were on everything. So, but they wanted to make sure these dogs could handle all this stuff. Right. You know, then they would take you in a room and they bring all these cameramen in because your dog, you're going to be surrounded by cameras doing this too. Some of the dogs couldn't handle that. So those dogs went home. So basically this two weeks was your final audition and they wanted to see what dogs could do what. And another aspect of this, we weren't allowed to talk to anybody. If we did, we had to call them by their dog's name. We weren't allowed to know anybody's name. So everybody called me Dixie for two weeks. And the reason being, they don't want you talking until they get the cast picked and then you're actually filming. They want everything to be raw and real and not any of us to know anything about each other whatsoever. So it's kind of tough not to be able to, hey, this is my story or hey, what's your story? You just talked about the training aspect. If you had to talk to somebody and talk about your dog and that was it. And then when you weren't, we weren't in this boot camp, you're upstairs in your hotel room locked away. So Dixie and I would just practice what we needed to practice. She really struggled with tugging. So I worked with her tugging and her hold in the hotel room for two weeks. Scent work. She, she dominates scent work. So, but we had to, I had to completely reteach her how to smell a different scent. She's like, she knows how to smell. We track deer for that. We track deer in hunting season. That's what we do. We track if a hunter shoots a deer, we track it for them because they can't if they can't find it. So I had to teach her to smell a birch smell, a birch oil. Birch so oil. they put in these little tin boxes on a Q-tip and it's got a magnet on it. Yep. You put that in the bottom of your dog's food bowl before we even got there. I guess I could backtrack a little bit. So for about two months on Sunday nights, we would have a Zoom meeting with everybody with all with both trainers we had nick vinegar from the united kingdom and nicole ellis from hollywood so we would have a zoom call with them every sunday night and they would show us what we needed to learn the following week and then on monday we'd have a box shipped to us full of, of the training tools that we needed wow so, so cool 
that's what we would do every week for two months leading up until we went to the boot camp. So that's why we were pre prepared to do all the stuff we had to do at boot camp. But for some reason, I just couldn't get Dixie to tug. So we worked and worked and worked and worked. And I finally got her to where she would tug a little bit, but I got her holding really, really good. So we would just work. <laughs> She's on my back now. Oh. We just worked in that hotel room, but that back to the birch oil, it would be in that little box. They taught us to, to put that in their food bowl and then put the food on top of it every time we fed them. Then they would associate that birch smell with their food. And then when they would smell that, they would alert you that they found it. So that's how we trained the dogs to smell that birch smell like we did. Now, um, tell the listeners the reason why Dixie wasn't good at tugging. tugging because uh, being a tracking dog, you don't want her to uh, be pulling or tugging on something. Am I correct? I think I read this somewhere. You well, explained it before. If, if they find a, a nice buck, you don't want them tugging on the face or anything, but all these dogs, when they find this deer, they go and they start tugging the hair out of the butt. So that's not really a big issue. And that's, that's what she does. We just never tugged a whole lot. Okay. You no, know, I just don't, I don't know if it's something to do with her mouth. If she's got a soft mouth, she doesn't, or, you know, she doesn't like that feeling. We just, we just never really done it a whole lot. I could, if I could turn this camera around and show you the corner of the room over here, she's got probably 200 bark box stuffed animals that she, that she doesn't tear up. She's it's never tore up a toy. Oh, Very okay. rarely will she pull the stuffing out. So I knew when they said we we're going to have to tug, I was going to have some issues, but we worked on it and I got her to do it just good enough. And it got us in, you know, just that two weeks is what it came down to, to, to me to get her to tug because tugging was a big part of the show. And, uh, Yes, if, if your dog couldn't tug, you wouldn't, you weren't going to make it. No, I, I, you're right. Tugging was a, a very big part of, of the show. And I remember at one of the uh, challenges, um, I think it was Duchess um, that, um, I forget her owner's name. Lucy. Lucy. Lucy tried so hard to get um, um, Duchess to tug. And at first it was like, she wasn't going to do it. And then I don't know, something clicked and she yeah. was able to, to pull and really win the, the challenge for them. And, and for me as a contestant and, you know, from meeting these folks in the boot camp when I first met them and to see their dogs where they were then to where they are now, it, it's, un, it's unbelievable. And Lucy and Duchess is a perfect example. They're probably the most surprising team on the show. Yeah. Never in a million years would I have thought they'd win as far as they had went, you know, and it's just, it was just so cool to see them. And Jack's the golden retriever, just a big, the oh, sweetest dog good. ever. Just, a, just But golden retrievers, they carry that puppiness with them. I think he's only like two or three years old. He's still a puppy. Yes. But to see him transform to where he started to where he ended up at when, you know, when the show was over, it's just unbelievable. That was probably one of the coolest things I took from the show was watching these dogs grow and watching the owners learn how to – to, to do these things with their dogs. Most of these people have never done scent work in their life. Yep. And now I know a lot of them are doing it to this day just to stimulate their dog's mind, you know, in the house, just doing different scent work stuff. So I think that was one of the best things that I took from the show was seeing from the whole process was seeing these dogs start from not really knowing anything to where they are now. And it was really cool to see that. Absolutely, I agree with you. And I, I personally do a lot of things with my dogs um, and I love it. For me, I know this is a controversial subject because some people say, oh, you know, dogs won't choose to do those kind of things. Uh, they'd rather be on the couch, uh, couch sleeping. I disagree. I am of the belief that uh, you do your dog an injustice by not allowing it to have adventures and go places and do things and challenge them to see what they can do. I know my golden retrievers, as far as golden retrievers go, you know, they're so laid back and stuff, but they love to learn new tricks. They love yep. to be outdoors. They love to travel. They love the ocean. You know, if you don't take your dogs out and do different things with them, if you, if you just leave them around the house and occasionally you take them out to do something here or there, that dog's not going to be a very, you know, well-behaved dog, you know, you got to put your dogs in situations that they can get used to and get accustomed to. And, and that goes back to, like I was saying, when she was a puppy at eight weeks old, 
I immediately started doing all this stuff with her to get her acclimated because I knew what I wanted to do with her. She needed to be used to being around a bunch of people like for the honor flight and all that stuff that we did for that prepared us little did we know at that time, but it prepared us for the TV show because she was already accustomed to all that stuff. She's already used to cameras in her face and people around her and all that kind of stuff. So it, it, I kind of compare it to like, if you got a kid that's good at all a bunch of sports, you know, I've got a buddy in this situation now, his kid's good at basketball, football, and baseball. Instead of just focusing on one sport, he plays all three sports and that makes him a better player at every, he takes something away from every thing that he does. And that's the same way with the dog. Dixie tracks and does scent work. That helps her in different aspects of things. She's does the therapy dog work. We do, uh, you know, retrieving and all that kind of stuff. You do all that stuff with your dog. It's going to make him good at everything. And they can utilize a little bit of all that and put it into something else. So a busy dog is a good dog. And a tired dog. Yeah, and a tired dog. Yeah. It's a good dog, especially puppies. And I I feel the more you teach them and the more you challenge them, the more they want to learn and do more. Yeah. You know, Dixie was, you know, she was four going into the film in the show. And they always say, you know, the old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. That's false. Look at these dogs that were on the show and look what they learned. You know, speaking of Dutch, I think Dutch's is eight or nine. 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 Yeah. And she learned all that stuff. So right. don't ever believe that you're, you can teach a dog to do anything if you know how to do it the right way. And it, you know, the, what I like to tell people, your dog is only as, is only as good as you are with them. You right. know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be the one to set your dog up for success. That's, that's the biggest thing you can know about training your dog, set your dog up for success. Because a dog that that does what you want it to do and you let it know that it did a good job, it's going to want to please you even more. So the more you can do that, the better that dog's going to be, the more it's, it's going to want to please you. So it's just a matter of getting out and doing all these things with your dog. Just put them in those circumstances and, and situations. And be positive. And right? positive for sure. Yeah. Positive, positive reinforcement. You know, you don't have to be harsh. You don't have to be mean. You don't you know, have to get mad or upset when your dog, you know. Definitely never, you know, I can just, I'm sure you can too, just being in public, you can tell people that have their dogs, you put your hand up by your dog's head and they do this. That guy probably hits their dog occasionally. You know, there's no reason to hit a dog. They don't, they don't know, you know, there's just no reason for it. And like you said, positive reinforcement is, you know, treats, uh, lots of good boys, good girls, lots of kisses, lots of hugs. That goes a long way. And that's what we were taught on the show. That's how these trainers train these dogs. That's how we were taught to train them on the show too. We were told from day one, there was absolutely no, you know, choke collars, no pinch collars, no e collars, none of that. This is all positive reinforcement training that we're doing. Don't even bring those with you. So me and this girl though, for the, for the stuff that we do in the woods, I do use an e-collar occasionally just in case for recall purposes, if she was to get on an animal off lead, she's not coming back. So I use the vibrate. She's trained with the vibrate. So she knows to to use that. So I had to go from using that to going to the show and not having it at all. And being in these situations where, boy, this is kind of, kind of touch or go with her. Let's see what happens. But you know, she knocked it out of the park. She did great. Never had any issues with her. The only, the only reason she got held back in anything was because of me doing stupid things, you know, that's what, that's what got us on the show. You know, you know, like, again, your dog's only as good as you are, you know? So what was the best challenge for you and Dixie? Which one did you enjoy the most? And which one were you disappointed in, you know, the, not the challenge, but maybe how you did. Um, disappointed wise, let me think here. I had so many disappointing moments We're like, man, I, I wish I could have done that different. You know, like taxi cab rides. That's all on me. That has nothing to do with her. You know, she did everything, everything great. You know, there was a couple, uh, Italy, the tugging thing, you know, none of the dogs could really tug. So in our pack, Ace stepped up and did that whole tugging competition pretty much by himself. So she could, the way I taught Dixie to tug was almost like she was going to retrieve it and bring it to me. That's how she would tug. So when you're in a timed event, a timed competition like that, it's hard to take the time to set her up to go that route. So that's why uh, we kind of struggled still with the tugging, but at least she would do it. Yeah. So I would say that any of the tugging challenges kind of, kind of got us, you know, 
but I'm super, super proud. Whenever we got to do a scent challenge, um, like Austria, for instance, we, we had to do, Dixie and I had to do the maze. Well, her barking kept me from knowing the clue was on the platform that we had to find. I found the platform, but I didn't know to go up in it and get the clue. So I cost us five minutes on that challenge. But at the end, we had to do a scent challenge. And this girl killed that scent challenge. She found two pieces like in five minutes and dug me right back out of that hole. So I knew if I screwed up, she would come back and, and pull me out of the hole that I dug for. So, I mean, I, she always, she always helped me. I knew I could count on her. It was just, could she count on me? And there were certain times where I messed us up and, and cost us some time. So, but she would always pull us out. Yeah, she was amazing. Really, she was. Um, would you say Dixie is a people dog or a dog dog? So if there's a crowd and there's dogs, does she prefer to be with the crowd or go and say and play with the dogs? Say people hello. for sure. She's like a she's like a dog snob. She's kind of like a diva. She <laughs> and I, I really don't like how she that she's like that. I kind of do and I don't. I don't want her just walking up to any random dog, you know, and because we do a lot of off lead stuff. I don't want her just walking up to, an, to some dog and because you don't know how that dog's. I don't I trust her. I don't trust other dogs. So but she doesn't really bother other dogs. She might look at me like, uh, yeah, whatever. And go about her business. So she's kind of like a, a dog snob. She'll definitely go to a person first. And if there's five grown ups over here and two kids over here, she's going right to the kids. She absolutely loves kids. I don't have any kids. It's just in her nature. She just loves kids, you know, but she's definitely a people person for sure. Which country was your favorite? My favorite country was Switzerland. Just, it was so beautiful and the, the snow and the cold weather and just, just a beautiful place, you know, and I would love to go back where I can actually enjoy it, you know, because when we're filming, you don't have time to do anything. You're filming, you're concentrating on that. You don't really get to take it all in. You try to, but you're so worried about not going home and doing everything right that you don't really take it all in. But Switzerland and Northern Italy there when we're, because we drove from Italy to Switzerland. We drove from Florence up into Switzerland. So we drove through the Alps through Northern Italy, just beautiful. The food in Italy was amazing. The food in Switzerland and Austria, not so much. It was kind of bland, but a lot of wiener schnitzel. Um, Italy had the best food, Switzerland, the best scenery. Um, uh, Costa Rica was beautiful too. Uh, the jungle, you know, the monkeys, the sloths hanging from the trees. We had sloths hanging outside our window at our hotel and we were right on the ocean. It was just amazing, amazing place. That what you guys don't see on the show, or actually what you don't hear on the show in Costa Rica, the locusts or the cicadas, whatever they call them down there, were so loud. You could barely have a conversation with the person next to you when we were in the jungle. So I don't know how the sound people pulled that off, but they did. You don't even notice them on the, on the show. So no, I don't remember hearing any I, of that. I don't know how they got them out of there. And then, you know, the, the whitewater rafting down that river with the dogs in the boat with us, that was, and if you've seen her, standing right on the front like a like a hood ornament, howling the whole way down the river. You know, made me a nervous wreck, but she's been on boats before, so she knows how to stay in them. And it, and it just, so, every place was cool to me. You know, I, one of the, Lucy today we were talking and from the show, and she was like, you know, I really appreciate how you were on the trip because you're, I'm one of the only ones that's never traveled out of the country before on the show. She goes, I, every time I would look up at you driving from Florence to Switzerland, you were awake. You never slept. I'm, and I said, no, I didn't sleep because I didn't want to miss anything. I knew I'd probably never, ever have the opportunity to see this again. And I didn't want to miss anything. So as long as it was daylight, I was awake watching and looking at everything. Yeah, that's absolutely amazing. Now, how have, um, when you guys were traveling on the plane, how did the dogs do traveling on the plane? Did Dixie just lay down and take a nap or sleep or was it kind Dixie's of hard a, to settle yeah, the down? A, well, we had our own airplane right. for the show. When we started filming, we had our own airplane, but when we weren't, like when you'd go home, you would fly home commercial, but Amazon would buy the whole row out for you. So you didn't have to worry about it. And most of the times the dogs could sit in the seat, but when we had our own airplane, it was set up for us to sit in first class with our dogs 
the dogs had the window seat, you had the aisle seat, and you put the bed in their seat, and they could sleep, look out the window. A lot of us would even lay on the floor. We could do whatever we wanted on this plane, pretty much. The stewardesses would come by with the tray, which you've seen on the show, water and biscuits for the dogs and all that. I mean, they were they were pampered. But Dixie's really good at traveling on the plane. She likes to sleep. So once everything kind of calms down, she'll look around for a while, then she'll just lay down and go to sleep. We uh, we flew home from Paris. She, that's a 10-hour flight. She slept the whole way. You know, that's the whole way here. You know, they let her sit in the seat, and she slept the whole way. And that was commercial. You know, a lot of activity going around on the plane, and right. she slept. Oh, that's so amazing. Well, she, she was travels good. all that work. Yeah, she travels good. She loves, she loves, we got her own Jeep here that we do our events in. It's got her picture on it. And it's got a tribute to veterans on it. She absolutely loves riding in that. That's why she wears, her, excuse me. That's why she wears her goggles a lot because she likes hanging her head out the window and she oh. just travels good, you know? And then I can tell if we see somebody coming up to us that I know they're taking a picture or filming her everywhere we go in that Jeep. People are trying to catch up to us and take her picture or film her. So I'll have her howl back at them. And it, it's just a big thing for people to see her. And everybody gets a, gets a kick out of her. But she loves riding in that Jeep. That's so amazing. How, how do you, has your life changed a lot since the pack? It has. It, it was really tough, though. Like I said, I went through a breakup right before we had left the film. So I was gone for about, I think I was gone for 58 days. So, you know. My girlfriend and I had lived together for five years. So when I got home, I came home to an empty house. I didn't have anybody tell me when I couldn't eat or go to the restaurant like we did filming the show. I didn't have to have permission for all that. So I basically came home to, you know, by myself with nobody but her in a pandemic where you couldn't even leave to go out and do anything. So the first month was really hard for me to come back and and kind of refocus and it took me a month to kind of get back in the swing of things and you know go back to work you know before I left I my boss had, had said hey just just go and do the show when you come back whenever you're ready to come back to work come back and work so I took a month off after I got back just to kind of reacclimate myself and kind of get used to the new surroundings and being being by myself again and just I mean it's it's a lot to have that many people worried about what you're doing when you're filming a show like that to come at home to what I came home to, to, to just, it's like flipping a switch. So it was really hard to get used to. And, uh, but now since the show's come out, you know, this, she was already a celebrity and now it's everywhere we go. People, Hey, that's Dixie from the show. Now people are starting to recognize me a little bit. Cause I kind of had my own little, my own little image on there. I wore this vest everywhere and I always wore my bandana. So now people, people recognize me, you know, when they, when they see me out and about. So it, it's pretty cool to see all that. I'm just, COVID has really got us to where we couldn't really enjoy it as much as we should have. Um, we should be doing appearances, you know, everywhere right now. We can't do any appearances. You know, we should be riding this wave from the show out, but we can't do it because of COVID. We couldn't have our, our uh, premiere party in Hollywood would have been like with, like a real Hollywood premiere party, walking a red carpet with your dogs and celebrities there, but they couldn't do it because of COVID. So they had a drive-in premiere party at the Rose Bowl in California. But for those of us that don't live in California, Amazon wouldn't pay for us to come out there because of COVID liabilities. So we couldn't even go out to that. So what they did, they drove their cars into the Rose Bowl stadium. They drove it into a big dog house that had the pack logo on it. They took your picture and then you went up and you watched the first two episodes. Well, my friend owns a bar here by my house, a, a bar restaurant, and our COVID restrictions here are, were at that time were pretty reasonable. We were allowed to have 140 people in to my premiere party. So we didn't think we were going to be able to show any of the episodes because they weren't released yet. They weren't going to be released until the following day, but Amazon released them at nine o'clock our time. So I had a, me and Dixie had a police escort. We were in a vintage military Jeep with a top off of it. And this, the police officer drove us up to the venue, red carpet outside. Our Jeeps were parked out there with all these flashing lights going and all my friends and family and just people that wanted to come and see us and be a part of it. Cause this, this is Indiana. We don't get to see Hollywood stuff like that too often. So we pull up and we jump out and everybody starts taking pictures and coming up and hugging us. And 
we go inside, it's the same thing. And we had a little photo booth set up where they could get their picture with Dixie and get her. She was even giving out photographs with her paw. And we watched two episodes with 140 people. So I knew right then and there by the reaction of everybody that this show is cool. It's going to, yeah, everybody's yeah. going to love it because everybody was cheering in there and, and laughing and crying. And so I, I knew right then and there that it was going to be a, a successful show. Absolutely. It's my favorite show ever. I'm not going to lie to you. I watched it in one sitting, all the episodes. Yeah. And then a few days, a few days later, I watched it again. I just, yeah, you know, um, it's so uplifting. It's such a, a in, especially with COVID and yeah. you know, last year was so tough. It was so nice to see, because I'm such a dog person, it was so nice to see all these owners with their dogs and that bond and just going on all these amazing adventures and doing these challenges and their dogs loving it. Um, it's, it was really a, an amazing show. That, that was our main concern was we wanted the show to be positive, you know, because we all, when, when you put 12 people together that don't know each other that great and, and the circumstances we were in and the competitiveness of it, everybody had their moment where, Somebody might have got on somebody's nerves or you might have said something you shouldn't have said. You might have done something you shouldn't have done. You know, you might have pouted a little bit about something, but they didn't really show any of that. that and that was our concern that, that we wanted the show to come off as, as positive and uplifting and, you know, just to show the bond with our dogs and how our dogs can start out from not knowing how to do something to doing what they learned how to do. So the positivity part of it and the uplifting part was, that's what we take away. All of us that, that I, I talk to all the contestants every day, we're so happy that it was so positive and uplifting. And I'm getting messages from all over the world. You know, I just got one from where's Ichi, Ichiban, uh, Japan or something like that last night. Uh, uh, Mexico, South America, everywhere. I'm getting messages from all over the world from people that, hey, I just love you and Dixie on the show. I just wanted to tell you that. Or, hey, I love the show. So that that right there tells me that what we did was was pretty special and I'm glad people enjoy it. Absolutely. It was so special. What did, what, how did you feel when you and Dixie were coming home on the plane? What were your emotions? Uh, it was coming home. I mean, I mean, from the moment that, that we left in Switzerland, I mean, I, I think I went out in style, how, how I did it, you know, yes, you did. the, the, uh, when, when they show stuff like that, they make it closer than what it actually is. I don't know. I, we're to the point now we can talk about how I went home, I guess, because we're so most of everybody has seen the show. So yeah. in Switzerland, I got a bad cab ride. Every the the they they were trying to play it off that I kept telling them to go to the bus station or the train station. Well, it's pretty much the same area. So he could have took me to the right spot anyways. But anyways, when we didn't get there, he, I was 15 minutes behind every the two girls. I was leading at first, but he went the wrong direction. So then we came back and we caught back up. The girls had already went up to the top of the mountain. So they ended up being about five minutes ahead of me. So when I get up there, we stop for lunch. So we eat lunch and then the girls get to go and do their thing where they got to go up the mountain, and do the search and rescue. Well, they had a five minute head start on me where I had to just sit there and wait. So by the time I got to go out there and go up the mountain, Vane is already at the finish line. And as I'm going up the mountain, Chelsea's running down and I knew I was beat then, but I didn't want to give up. So I kept, I went all the way up and Dixie hit, the two uh, piles of snow and found where they had found their people at. And then we went and found our person, but they made it look closer than what it was. So we found our person. We come running down the mountain. I stopped probably a hundred yards from the finish line. I just stopped and everybody's yelling, keep running, keep running. I just wanted to take it all in. That was my moment to kind of take it all in. I'm like, all right, think about how you're going to go out. I thought, you know what? I'm going to run. I'm going to slide across that finish line. <laughs> I just took off running and slid across it and, Dixie didn't know. She she didn't know we've won or lost. She didn't care. She was just happy to be there. She's howling, of course. So then I just started bawling. I mean, because it was I knew it was over. And so pretty tough moment for, to, for that to go out like that. Um, I felt like I let her down because I know we could have, you know, if I would have been more on top of things and got us to the right spot quicker, we probably wouldn't, we wouldn't definitely wouldn't have went home then. So but uh, just there's a picture of me riding the gondola leaving the mountain. Because once once you're eliminated, a product, you do your your interviews, which takes about an hour to do your exit interviews. 
the production assistant grabs you and they take you back to the hotel. You check out of that hotel and they put you in another hotel. They totally isolate you from everybody. You're not allowed to talk to anybody ever again. That makes sense. So that's a very, very tough spot to be in. That's one of the hardest things about the whole show is when that happens, that's it. You're, you're cut off from everybody. So that was tough. But there's a picture of me. I'm in the gondola and I'm just looking up like that. These big mountains behind me because it's all glass. And then Dixie's just looking out the window. And you can just see it in my face that, man, it's kind of kind of relief that it is over. But it's like heartbreaking that you're going home at the same time. So that was that was a pretty tough moment. And then I had to ride the train with all of them to Paris. But I wasn't allowed to talk to anybody, you know. So it's just – that's just the hard part about it. And that's just part of it, you know. But then you got to sit there and think about, do I want to complain about going home from what I just did? I just traveled the world with my dog. Right. There's nothing to be upset about. Absolutely. You know? So just – and it, it, that's why it was hard for me to complain about anything. Yeah, you had your <laughs> sit still. Yeah, you had your he's tired. You had your moments to where you were just tired and, and fed up. Sit down. Tired and fed up with stuff. Come here. You were tired and fed up with stuff, but then you got to think about the big picture of things, what you're doing and where you've been. Right. And, and just take it all in. It's like, man, this is super cool. There's no reason to complain about anything or be upset. So the only times I really got upset was at myself for letting her down. So, and like the, uh, the Costa Rica episode is a perfect example. I was ready to give up and I couldn't find that clue. And they even honed in on it. I looked down at her and she looked at me. I'm like, I, I can't give up. I should have went home in Costa Rica, but I didn't give up because of her. And when we came back and, and made it. So she uh, definitely, definitely pulled me through a lot. And that's why sitting in those hotel rooms, like we had to all those times, wasn't too bad because you got her, you got your dog with you. Right. You know? You're not alone. You got your dog with you. So she's definitely uh, is a, uh, she's my best friend for sure. You know, and got and me through a lot amazing. of stuff. You are both amazing. You are both amazing on the show. I want to ask you one last question and I can see that Dixie is tired and I, I would love for her to do one howl and one say a prayer for us. But there is a story about you and Dixie flying on a helicopter. Yeah, well, we've, before we even did the show, we have one of the veterans organizations we help out. Uh, there's a, uh, they have their own uh, Huey helicopter that they take the veterans events. Well, at one event, they asked us if we wanted to fly with them. I'm like, yeah, how many, because they can only fly like eight people at, at one time. And they, it, you got to donate a hundred bucks a person to fly in it. They're like, you guys want to fly in it? Somebody paid for you guys to fly in it. I'm like, all right, we'll do it. How many seats you got left? Well, you're the only person going. I said, well, hold on. Let's make an announcement. We were at, it was a, a music festival. So let's make an announcement real quick. So we made an announcement. I said, anybody wants to fly with Dixie on this Huey, we got seven spots. So let's go. People couldn't get there fast enough to be able to say they flew in a helicopter with her. So we go up in this Huey. She's got her goggles on. They got her strapped in and we're flying all over Indianapolis, you know, going side to side. And there's video of that on her social media. You can go look at it. There's a great TikTok video that I made of it. Um, you can just see. She don't, she doesn't, nothing faces her. She just hanging her head out looking. She was actually probably trying to smell animals down there because we were flying over the woods and that's what it kind of looked like. So, yeah, I watched the video and I was amazed. She just sat there and was cool, calm and collected, just looking out, looking down. Um, I mean, she's just so impressive, honestly. Yeah, not, not much bothers her. I mean, and that goes back to what we were talking about earlier. If you want your dog to do certain things, you got to put them in those situations at an early age to get them used to doing it. And the, the biggest thing I can tell people to do is get your dog around a lot of people. If you want them to be a, any type of a therapy dog or anything like that, the more people you can have them around at an early age, they get used to that where right. people doesn't, doesn't, you know, freak them out or noises don't freak them out, you know? So right. this goes back to how we started off when she was eight weeks old. It's all kind of like come full circle. And that's kind of what I tell everybody about my, my life story. I lost jobs in the past and the accident, the house fire. If some of that stuff wouldn't have happened, I wouldn't have found myself with this opportunity to be on the show, to have this special dog. And the most importantly, be in the position to help people like she helps people. So it all happened for a reason. And Dixie's the reason. Sometimes it's so hard when you're right in the middle of a tragedy or a difficult um, time or situation in your life. It's so hard 
to look ahead and be hopeful and stay positive. Um, so what you, that's why I find your story so inspiring and your courage and your tenacity and your will to, you know, put uh, the bad stuff behind you and just have Dixie and do good and help other people. Thank you for that, Brian. Um, it's it's and truly a much- If you would know me from a, priority. if you would know me from a young man, I was always, I think it had a lot to do with uh, anxiety and that kind of stuff. I didn't realize I knew that I had when I was a young man. And I would always get upset about a lot of stuff and pout and different stuff like that. So once the stuff, I think the stuff happened to me for a reason to get me out of that mindset, to try to teach me to be more of a, a positive person, you know, and I'm still, you know, got my times when I can be down and, you know, Vandy on the, on the green pack, she's the most positive person I've ever met in my life. She helped me a lot, gave me a lot of great talks when we were, you know, filming the show and kept me, kept me up. And so that's another thing to take out of the show too, is just another Another thing to, you know, to look at, just look at the big picture of things, you know, you, we could all have it so much worse. And that's kind of how I kind of, I've been on the bottom. I know what the bottom looks like. So that, that kind of helps me keep going. And when I see somebody else that's going through some struggles, I've got experience. Now I can go talk to them say, Hey, this is where I was at. This is what I did to get out of it. And uh, one of the big things I've been doing lately is, you know, we've, Right before I left to film the show, we had a canine officer shot and killed in Indianapolis. When I came home, we had another one, the same deal. So we, Dixie's the only uh, civilian, we're the only civilian dog team allowed to participate in the funeral procession. So I've made sure that I talk to these handlers and I tell them my story, how I cope with losing my dogs. And that the best thing to do is to go out and get another dog and, and pay tribute to the dog that you lost and, and go from there. And that's what these gentlemen have done. And I'm just, you know, it sounds bad, but I'm lucky enough to have the, to be that have went through what I went through. Now I can use that to talk to people like that who have lost their dogs or you go through a house fire, or even if you lose a loved one or something, I can kind of compare that to it. And right. just all that stuff I've been through. I try to use that to help people if I can. That's what I try to do. That's amazing. Um, it's also a testament to you because, you know, Brian, there are people that bad things happen and um, they, they can't move beyond it. They just stay, you know, down there in the dumps and, um, you know, in the sadness and the depression. So um, it's a testament to you. And it sounds like on the show, you were able to make some amazing friends. So not only did you travel the world with Dixie, did all these amazing adventures, but you made some great friends. Yeah, we have a, uh, we have a group text and we talk every day. That's awesome. all of it. Yeah, we talk every day. You know, there's, there's a hard, there's a, there's 10 of us that talk every day. We don't talk much to Daniel or to uh, Lynn, just because I don't think we really got to know them that great, you know, but the, the other 10 of us, we talk every day on the group text. We help each other out with different things. We're all trying to get, different things going. And then if one person can help the other person, we do. Um, we're starting, everybody's starting to come out with their own merch now. So we're trying to help each other with that and just uh, social media. We're trying to get everybody, you know, get their following up and just, we're all, we're like a, a little dog family now. We're, we're, we're a pack, you know, and that's, it's funny that the show's called the pack because the dogs actually packed up during the show, you know, if we would see a dog outside the vehicle, the dogs would start barking at it to let the other dogs know, Hey, there's a dog that's not in our pack. So that was kind of funny. And that's kind of funny how the humans have packed up now too. You know, we're, a, we're a family pack in, and we all look out for each other. It's like a little brotherhood, the doghood. It is. It <laughs> is. We're, you know, we're the pioneers for this show. We're the ones that went wow. to it and did everything first. So anything that comes after this, they owe us some gratitude for what we went through. You know, right. we kind Everybody of paid. Always way. look to you guys as the example, yeah. you know, and you yeah. were the trailblazers. Yeah, this was the the first show of its kind like this for anybody to try. So it was kind of new to everybody. So we were kind of feeling our way through everything. So, and I still think it went off pretty good. It was amazing. Absolutely. Lastly, Brian. Um, your dreams and hopes for the future. My dreams and hopes for the future. I would love to, to do a, 
another show like that maybe or a movie dixie was in a movie over the when we got back she had a small part in a movie called the mayberry man where she played the uh, lead character's dog so she just had to follow him around the house and do stuff like that and i thought that would be easy you know doing stuff that's scripted but it was just as hard as a reality show i was just as nervous as a dog dad man i hope she does it good i hope she does it good but i would love to get her in some stuff like that you know, some, some movies or another show, or I've got some ideas to have her own TV show about what we do, you know, kind of focus on the veteran stuff and the kids stuff and um, the, the outdoor, the tracking and all that kind of stuff. I think it'd be interesting for people to see that you know, people love hearing my stories and seeing my pictures. So why wouldn't they like to watch it too? And I know uh, I would, I would love yeah. it. And actually I went to look for you guys on YouTube. I couldn't find you. I, ha I don't have a YouTube page yet, but I've been, I keep having people tell me I need to start one. You the definitely have to. You have to definitely YouTube do lots of YouTube videos so we can watch you all the time. I have a lot of videos on Facebook, of, on her Facebook page. But as far as me, come here, just, you're almost done here. <laughs> Shame. as far as me filming stuff and handling her to get her to do stuff it's very hard so and i'm really you know i'm pretty much like a uh, that's another goal of mine is to start a non-for-profit i'm going to call it the praying dog foundation when i get it going it's hard for me to pay i pay for all this out of my pocket so in order for me to have a camera guy come with me i'd have to pay him so it's right. just hard for me to be able to handle her and film stuff at the same time i try to do it when i can or if i got a friend that'll go and film but I'm definitely going to start uploading some videos and start a YouTube page, but I have quite a few videos on her page, but I'm not real tech savvy. So I don't know how to edit and all that kind of stuff. If I could, I'd be dangerous. She probably would have her own TV show by now if I had all that, but that is definitely a dream of mine to do something like that. And, and I love to travel the world again with her, just, you know, on a vacation with her, but yeah, where we can enjoy things, but a lot, lots of stuff out there. And I just, I'm almost overwhelmed. At this, at this point, because there's so much stuff that I want to do, almost to the point, I don't know where to start. So that's a good thing. That's a great my sister, My sister has kind of stepped in here lately and kind of helped me with my business side of things, you know, setting endorsement deals up and that kind of stuff. Um, helped me with my merch. We're getting ready to come out with some T-shirts and sweatshirts and coloring books. And we're working on maybe a ringtone with Dixie Hallen on it. Um, a calendar for praying at different places. Um, Amazon has come out with these Dixie dogs that you can, that you can buy. Oh, that's I don't get any, I don't get any proceeds out of that. They send some of it to my dog charity, which was a central Indiana canine association. They take care of all the police dog training and vet bills and that type of stuff. So I, I have so many ideas. I just need the, it's just overwhelming right now. So I'm trying to feel my way through it and, I just need some help almost. And luckily my sister's kind of stepping in and, and helping, but I've kind of got some ideas what I want to do, but definitely TV stuff. I would love to do more TV stuff with her. She is definitely the star. Oh, you both are. And you're both amazing. And I, I, I think it's going to happen for you guys. You just need a sponsor. And I think you are well on your way to getting one. Um, so um, I know I, kept you guys on here for such a long time and I can see poor Dixie is tired. You want to see, let's see if we can get her to how. Yes, and, and say a prayer for us, please. Dixie can, you, Dixie, can you pray? Dixie, pray. Oh. Amen. 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 Here, up, tell them, tell them. Let me give her a little treat. <laughs> All right, Dixie, up, up. Tell him thank you. Tell her, say thank you. Tell him, say thank you. Say thank you. Tell him. Tell him, Dixie, say thank you. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him one more time. One more time. Good girl. Pretty good for her being tired. Yes, it's very late at night. Thank you so much, Dixie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Brian. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on my show. I really appreciate it so much. If there's ever anything I can do to help, please don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I wish you and Dixie 
the very best. I'm so excited for both of you. I can't wait to see you guys on another show, on a TV show, in a movie, on YouTube. Um, again, thank you so much. Well, you're very welcome. And again, if, if anybody wants to learn more about us, they can go to Dixie the Praying Dog at Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. And uh, we're actually on Cameo now too, where you can go and pay to have a specialized video sent to you. That's really been taken off pretty good too. So you can go to Cameo and look up Dixie the Praying Dog and we'll, uh, we'll send you a special message to uh, happy birthday or tell your veteran happy, uh, thanks for their service or whatever. So we're out there, just send us a message. We'll try to accommodate whatever we can. That's wonderful. And you said that you're gonna come out with some merchandise soon? Yeah, we, we're working on merchandise. It's been really hard to kind of get uh, the design. I'm on, I'm on my third designer right now, so I think this guy's really going to get it done for us. We've got we've got some really good patriotic designs with like a new Dixie logo. That's really cool. I'm really excited about. Love it. And you know, everything that we have is going to have an American flag on it because yes. if you watch the show, everywhere we went. I had an American flag on. She had an American flag on. We had an American flag on our backpack. So all of her shirts will have the American flag on it at some at somewhere on there. But yeah, we've got the shirts coming, and that's really what I want, what I want to get out there first. And there's so many ideas that we have, but the the, the a book with her where you can press the buttons and hear it'll, her howl. Hear her howl. We got. We know yeah. we're kind of working on that. I do have a coloring book that is being done. We will have a coloring book. I think they've got seven or eight pages done of it right now. And it's patriotic. It teaches the kids uh, the Pledge of Allegiance and shows, shows Dixie with veterans and the kids can color it. So all that's coming. It's just very, very time consuming. It's a long process and it's pricey. You know, I got to pay for all this out of my pocket until I can get stuff rolling. So, right. but it's coming. Just be patient and I promise you it's coming. And if anybody wants to, wants to talk to us or, Whatever you want, just Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and TikTok, Dixie the Praying Dog. I'm pretty active on there, and I try to respond to everybody. Well, I truly appreciate that you took the time with Dixie to be on my podcast uh, tonight. Thank you so much. It was such a huge honor. I wish you and Dixie the best. And uh, maybe come back another time and tell us more about some more adventures and new things that you and Dixie are in. Oh, yeah, for sure. Once we get through this pandemic and we get back to a normal life for everybody around the world, we can start traveling and doing our uh, our therapy dog visits. That's what we love to do. So hopefully we're on the tail end of everything and we can get back to normal. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Brian and Dixie. You guys take care. Thank you very much. We're so uh, happy we could uh, join you guys tonight.